I'm pretty sure that I cut off last week by the grace of God on Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 through 6. I know that Pat Muller was on. I don't know who else was on, but am I correct or am I incorrect? Will somebody put something in the chat? Hold on. Oh, that's not. Okay. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I um think I think that uh I I stopped on this particular I think you did scripture. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I I I thought I did too. So we're going to pick up here today tonight. Thank you. Revelation 20 verses 4 to 6. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. John saw the Romans. It is imperative to note that John didn't say how many. He did not numerically identify these thrones like he did in other passages in this book. Nor did he indicate that they were the thrones about which he wrote previously. It is to be understood that these thrones occupied a space of prominence which captured John's attention because they are the first thing he mentions after his description of the events in verses 1, 2, and 3. Here four, he numerically identified the throne of God the Father, and of course he identified the 24 thrones on which the elders were seated or will be seated. Also, these thrones are not in heaven. The first set of thrones he saw with the 20 and four elders and the throne of God was in heaven. And we have to pay very close attention to where these things are occurring. But these thrones are on earth. And these thrones are representative of seats of authority and judicial administration. Although the word throne is commonly appropriated for the seat of a ruling monarch, such as king or queen, and we can see a lot of the stuff now that's in the news and have been in the news about uh, the monarchs of England. This is not what is being spoken of here. These thrones don't mean that. In the sense that John wrote about these thrones, they are seats occupied by judges. 
The meaning here is the implication that from these thrones, justice will be dispensed to the world. And I know that because in the next sentence, it is written that judgment was given to them. Scripture also references the thrones of the house of David that were set in Jerusalem for the purpose of judgment in Psalms 122 and 5. Although John writes about seeing those who will sit on the thrones and the fact that judgment will be given unto them, he doesn't specify who they are. The gist of what he writes is that for the duration of the millennial period, God will entrust the judgment of the world to those who are sitting on the throne. It could be that John is under the impression that we will understand about whom he is writing based on the word of God. Also, John uses a colon after this statement about the thrones and those sitting on them. Now, typically a colon is used after a complete statement or thought, and after that, it's typically followed by a list of things, you know, several different things coming after that colon, sometimes separated by commas, sometimes separated by semicolons. So therefore, when reading this, there's no need for him to list who was on the throne prior to the colon. Now there are three primary groups of people listed by John after the colon. A, souls who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. B, souls who were beheaded for the word of God. And C, souls who did not worship the beast nor his image and did not take his mark. Now, the rapture saints are not listed in this group or set of different categories of people because there's no need. The rapture took place way before this all happened. The beheaded souls are those whose heads were removed by virtue of an ax because of their witness of God and because they believed and embraced God's word. They refused to worship the beast or his image, as well as take the mark of the beast on their foreheads or their hands. They love God more than their own lives and were faithful unto death. Now, I talked about the raptured saints in volume one of this book, chapter four. Those raptured saints were not dismembered in any way. These are resurrected souls who are alive. As evidenced in John's delineating them from the rest of the dead 
who will not live again until the end of the thousand years. And this is important that we make sure we understand this. It's written in Romans 5.17 that those who died for their faith will reign with Christ. Now, when researching this passage, we will find that there are many variations about who these souls are. Whether the thrones are in heaven or on earth, some commentators say they're in heaven, some say they're on earth. And whether or not the souls are resurrected from the dead or whether they are corporal or corporeal, corporeal, physical material bodies. They won't have bones and kidneys and livers and hearts like we do now, but they will be corporeal bodies, much like Jesus was when he was seen by the disciples and the women. Okay. When Jesus was resurrected, he took pains to make it clear to his disciples that he was not a spirit, but that he was flesh and bone. Luke 24, 36 to 43. The bone part all depends on what version of the Bible you're looking at. He was flesh. We do know that. In other words, his soul had an outer shell, but not like the physiological bodies that we have today. In reality, he made it plain that he had a corporeal, C-O-R-P-O-R-E-A-L body, which if you look that word up, I looked it up in Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, it means having tangible, you can touch it, qualities such of a body, such as shape, size, and resistance to force. In other words, it's not like we see on TV where somebody walks through the body. It's not that kind of a body. If Jesus' body was solely spirit, he would not have invited the disciples to touch him. And think about this. He was able to eat a piece of fish and honey in their presence. What I believe happened is that Jesus' heavenly body fused spirit and physical matter together so that they made one immortal incorruptible, glorious, and perfect body that embodies the fullness of joy that God possesses. Now, there is sufficient evidence in scripture to support what I'm saying. And there is sufficient commentaries to support, or there are sufficient, to support what I'm saying. Jesus did not have a metaphysical body. We will not have a metaphysical body. Now, time won't give, I don't have time to go into all the varying interpretations regarding what I'm saying. But if you think about it, 
we know that in order for these souls, and they call them souls, to judge for a thousand years, they could not be human because no human has lived a thousand years. The Bible says they would die within a day. No man has lived a thousand years. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. There's no evidence of any flesh as we know it having lived for a thousand years and much less these people did not age. They did not age. So you have to think about and it takes the Holy Ghost to reveal this. Flesh and blood will never, it will never reveal it. We will always be confused trying to figure that out with our finite minds. The completion of the thousand years ends the first resurrection. And now in the fifth verse, we see the rest of the dead. In a parenthetical statement, it comes before the statement which reads this is the first resurrection. And in order to understand that, we have to go back to verse 4 that describes those who ruled with Jesus during the thousand-year reign of peace on earth as judges. So there will be people all over the world, peoples with an S, because it would be all ethnicities, all creed, all kind. Yes, there will be people who will, will be on earth in, the, in that thousand years, having babies, marrying, given in marriage for a thousand years of peace. Now, couple of things we have to understand here. I challenge you to find scripture supporting the premise that the dead will be resurrected during the first resurrection. I challenge you, show me the scripture. The dead will not be resurrected during that first resurrection. Death, the sea, the grave, Mm -mm. not during the first resurrection. And Paul agrees that both the just and the unjust will be resurrected at one point in time, but not here. Acts 24 and 15 says, and have hope toward God which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. That's the second resurrection that we're going to get into. But right now we're dealing with the first. And as I said, when I was teaching from volume one, the rapture was not a resurrection. Don't get that confused. The rapture was not a resurrection. We were caught up. Jesus never touched foot on the earth when the saints of God were raptured. Now, if you must if you feel more comfortable saying, well, the rapture had to be a resurrection, then you're saying there are three resurrections. 
But if that's the only way you can understand it, then by all means, please. We have been constantly told by our Lord and his apostles, as well as in Daniel 12, that there will be two resurrections of absolutely different characteristics, one of the just and the other of the unjust. Those partaking in the first resurrection are called blessed and holy, expressing their state of grace from God. This is a resurrection of power and privilege because the Bible says the second death will have no power over them and they will reign with God during the millennium. Now the remaining dead, the rest of the dead, are those who are not privileged to take part in the first resurrection. And as such, they're not blessed because they will fall under the power of the second death. John described the two resurrections in chapter 5, verses 28 to 29. He said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. MacArthur writes that among those in the first resurrection are those who survive the tribulation spiritually. It is not the raptured saints. I keep saying that. We're not going to go through the tribulation. It will be the converted, believing remnant of Israel and the nation is restored to the land God promised Abraham, as well as a time when Gentile nations will worship the king. It will be a time when the curse is lifted, when food will be plentiful, and when there will be a physical health and well-being leading to long life. That thousand years, the first resurrection. Now, there are some dissensions regarding whether these souls are corporeal. As I said, combination, we're, we're not corporeal because we're flesh. Corporeal looks like flesh. And it is a combination or fusing or mending of flesh and spirit. Some say that they're only spirit. I don't believe that because when I read about Jesus after he was resurrected, he could talk, he could walk, he could eat. He still had the scars in his body. So therefore, he could not, quote, unquote, heal. He could not bleed. He did not have a spleen or a, sp or a spine or a heart like we have. But he looked like himself. Although some didn't recognize him. 
it took a spiritual eye to recognize who he was. So I include 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 57. And I would ask you to read that entire chapter and ponder over it, pray over it, ask God to show you. Paul's point here is that just as our present body is like Adam's physical body, so our future body will be like Jesus's resurrected body. Adam's physical body died and we will die in the flesh. But our resurrected body will live for eternity. Paul reiterates the point that flesh and blood cannot, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. In its present state, our bodies have to be transformed so that we can be resurrected. They have to be changed. That's why Paul says that he is showing us a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This corruptible body has got to put on in corruption. It cannot decay. It can't rot. And this mortal body has got to put on immortality. It will never die again. It will live forever. It won't grow up in age. An infant who goes to heaven will remain I think an angel, I think that's what happened to infants who go to heaven. I think that they are made angels. I don't know, but that's my belief. Because an, a newborn child, an infant, even though it was, it's born in sin, and, you know, it's shaping in, in, in corruption because flesh is corrupt, that baby, I believe, is an angel. So this brings us to Revelation 20, verse 7 to 10. And I don't want to go but my time. I don't see my clock. Almost done. Okay, write your questions down because we're going to ask for questions at the end of this. I know some of it is <clears throat> a lot. And you really have to read and ponder and pray and fast for God to show you. I know you're not going to get it the first time around if you do you a whole lot better than I did because I had to really study and ponder fast and pray Revelation 27 to 10 says and when the thousand years are expired Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. It's a lot of people going to be on this earth 
at the end of that thousand years. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And we know the beloved city is Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I know some people say, oh, the devil is never going to be destroyed. He's not. He's just going to be confined forever. He's never going to be free again. Once this happens, that's a wrap. He will never be free again. He'll be loose after a thousand years. He'll go right back to doing what he always did. And when he gets put into the lake of fire and brimstone, he stays there for eternity. So now we see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords together with his glorified body of saints some say on the earth, some say over the earth. I believe they were on the earth during this time. And the thousand year period has come to an end. And we know that during the thousand year or millennial reign, there were believers with glorified bodies and humanity who is still corruptible. So you have two sets of people. You have people with corporeal bodies and you have just plain flesh and blood humans. It's the humans that Satan comes and corrupts. These people never worshiped God during the thousand years. They had a thousand year of peace, but they did not worship God for that thousand years. So they were reproducing. And they had, during the thousand years, they will have the right to choose whom they will serve. God is not going to inflict himself upon them. He's not going to force them to serve him. They still have a right. They can't war. They can't kill for a thousand years. They've got to live in peace, but it was killing them inside just to have to live in peace and not be able to cause havoc. So even though Satan will be bound and inactive during these generations that are populating in the earth, he still has followers. He still has followers. And what they're going to do is they're going to falsely pretend that they're conforming to the rulership and that they're not going to cause any trouble. But inside, in the privacy of their own homes, they don't want to serve God. And they resent those who have been set up to judge the world. So once Satan is loosed, the opportunity now is given to them to reject the very one who has been shepherding them and keeping peace on earth. And they're going to join forces with his enemy, who is Satan. We've all heard the term fair with the friends. Somebody who uh, Judas kiss, 
people who pretend to like you and get along with you, but if they ever get the opportunity to stab you in the back or ruin your reputation, they will do it. But although these people think that they're deceiving God, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. They forgot that he's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and he knows the intent of their heart. He allows them freedom of choice. And because he didn't impose or will not impose himself upon them during this thousand years, because he allows them freedom of choice, they are going to be led by Satan to their final rebellion and utter destruction. Now, why? You got Satan confined. Why free him? Why? him. Why? Let him out of the pit. He was in the abyss for a thousand years. It's God who's going to free Satan. Satan don't have the power to free himself. It is God. When my children were little, they used to go, go through the house screaming, why, why, you know, playing. And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I feel like kids saying, why, why? John told us in verse three that Satan's freedom will be for a little while. But he doesn't tell us in verse three, why? God set Satan free. And in reality, we will never know every reason why after God's people dwell with him on a sit will dwell with him on a sinless earth for a thousand years. You know they had to know who Satan was. They're going to rise up against God. A lesson learned here it, for me personally is that people don't even need Satan's diabolical influence because sin is ingrained in us. And Satan alone is not the sole source of the sin that is found within the human heart. Satan also possesses knowledge of God's word and knows that his ultimate end is going to be total confinement forever. But yet and still, despite that knowledge, Satan cannot change his diabolical nature of deception and destruction. And the one thing that he cannot overcome is his unreasonable hatred for God and for those whom God has redeemed. If we don't think that Satan hates us, we are bonkers. He hates us. And so even after a thousand years of inactivity, his nature is unchanged. Just like his nature was unchanged when he was cast out of heaven. It is his nature 
We all know the story about the man who took the frozen snake and took care of it and, and warmed it by putting it under his coat up near his heart. And when the snake thawed out, the snake bit him and he was dying and he asked, why? And the snake said, it's my nature. It is the nature of some people to sin. I don't care. They could come in church and speak in tongues. They're going to go back to sin because that is their nature. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 wrote, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did is weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. What did God say to Satan when he took his legs in the book of Genesis? He would crawl in the dust of the earth forever. And just as he is saying to himself and to those crazy angels who followed him, I will ascend. I will do this. I will exalt. I will be upon the mount of the congregation. God put him down under the earth into the pit of hell forever that's where he's going to go now says makes the point that god allows satan liberty he allows him liberty then he denies him liberty when he is put in the pit. He is denied liberty, and then he grants him liberty once again when he loose him from the pit. The purpose for this could be to show humanity that they can do nothing without God's grace. What we will what will happen among humanity upon Satan's release is just like what happened to Adam and Eve when humanity embraced the very thing that God forbid them to do. God forbade them and they said, we're not going to listen to you, God. Because you're just trying to hold us back. You don't want to see us be like you. So we're not going to listen to you. They call lies true and truth lies. Ironside says, tested in the garden of delight, Man broke through the only, the one and only prohibition laid upon him. Tested under conscious corruption and violence filled the earth and the scene cleared by the deluge. Tested under restraining influence of divinely appointed government Man went to idolatry, thus turning his back upon his creator. Tested under law, he cast off all restraint and crucified the Lord of glory. Tested under grace, in this present dispensation of the Holy Spirit, he has shown himself utterly unable to appreciate such mercy, has rejected the gospel and gone ever deeper into sin, tested 
under the personal reign of the Lord Jesus Christ for a thousand years, some will be ready to listen to the voice of the tempter when at the close he ascends from the pit of the abyss bent upon one last defiant effort to thwart the purposes of God. As written in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? Saints of God, it is important that we conceptualize a thousand year history of the blessing of God's peace and divine protection. Nevertheless, humanity casts all of this aside because it believes it can have more, although it will mean diametrically opposing God's perfect will. Their corrupted human nature will be certain that attacking God is better than submitting to his law and to his word. At this point, I am going to stop and next week I'll start to talk about God and make God. Are there any questions? Do I need to clarify anything for anybody? It's a lot that we're, we're having to go through. And that's why I say to you, study on your own time. You're going to, if you really want to get this, don't take my word for it. Do your own study. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't even know where to begin, but um, I will say, I don't ever recall hearing the word corporeal. Um, just trying to get that in my brain and what that entails. Um, but just listening through this whole, these last several chapters, it's such a pro profound word of God that meets such depth and breadth um, for us in this, in this state of mind. So we definitely have to stay before God asking him to mm -hmm. open our understanding, help us to link the scriptures from the Old Testament, which already pronounced what was going to happen in the New Testament. Yeah. Yes. So we have to we have to be able to see it mm -hmm. and understand it. Like when you brought up what Isaiah was saying, but it's throughout the Old Testament in Daniel. Yes, um, yes, Daniel, definitely. Daniel, right. And I just pray for me, but I pray for all of us in this teaching. And for those that would like to be here, but for some reason cannot be, Mm -hmm. Did God help us to take this, eat the word, study the word, just stay in God's presence and ask him to help us mm -hmm. to get what he wants us to get out of all of this? Because it is a lot, Mother Motley. It is a lot. Um, I know. I just think even when each time you're preaching this or teaching this, we could go back through the same thing the next time and always get something else. Yes. You yes. know, it's, it, that's just the way, from my personal point of view, that's just the way I've kind of seen it. And that's how God's word is. That's how it's supposed to be. The more you go through the word, new things. Right, right. It's before insights of the word. Right. God puts there. Right. So now I do have, you're right. I do have one question when you, when Jesus, after the resurrection, when Jesus appeared 
to the disciples. And I'm going back to corporeal. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, the scar and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't just flesh like we're flesh anymore. No. That's not how he was anymore. Mm -mm. But mm -hmm. he wasn't totally spirit because he mm -hmm. told them they could touch. Yes. Yes. So that's what I'm trying to get through my head as well. Yeah. You know, that's why the um, word says it does not yet um, appear. Right. What uh, we should. Mm -hmm. But we know we shall be like him. Like him. And that whole conceptualization of flesh, spirit mixed. People don't. They can't get it. Okay. They can't get it. And that's, you know, the whole thing of the spirit of God being within us. Right. You know, he blew his spirit in us. Right. And I believe in the way I see it, it's just like the spirit of God is just like giving birth to a newborn. You can let that spirit lie there and not take care of it, and eventually it will die. Right. Or you can feed and nurture that spirit. And as that spirit begins to grow, unlike the natural where the baby takes on the characteristics of the mom, we will begin to take on the characteristics of the spirit. Absolutely. And so it, it behooves us to feed the spirit. A baby can't thrive. A baby will never learn how to walk unless an adult teach it. We will never learn how to walk spiritually unless we let the spirit of God teach us. Exactly. Okay. And so until we begin to see these things through the eyes of the spirit and not the eyes of flesh, through the understanding of the spirit and not our own understanding, right. we'll never get it. That's true. Absolutely. We'll never get it. Now, if you look up corporeal, they'll try to say a corporeal body. They have this map, you know, with the three arms and the three legs. But spiritually corporeal, that's not corporeal. A corporeal body, there are no bones, no heart, no kidneys, nothing in a corporeal body when you're looking at it in the spiritual that's going to age. So, um, yeah, it, it takes some takes some study and some getting used to um, to understand that. And I, Pastor Bonner used to try to teach it to us. But at the time he was teaching it to us, I didn't get it. Right. Yeah. yeah. But now I do. After years of studying and reading and seeking God, now I do. I finally get it. I don't get it 100 percent, but I get it enough to, to know, to have an idea of what I'm going to look like. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I thank and praise God for your teaching. Um, thank and praise God for giving you the understanding and the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to teach us um, the book of Revelations, which is so needed and so present in today's world, how the world is shaping itself towards destruction. So thank you, Mother Motley. Well, I thank and praise God, too, because... I just have to stay prayed. I have to keep my mind on him um, so that he will show me exactly, you know, he pulled back the layers for me because I don't want to tell anybody anything that's not true. And I'll sit on one verse for days, sometimes week, one verse. And you all know I have taught <laughs> one verse, two verses. We're not going past this. Because I've got to, and those two verses will take forever, forever, um, 
to teach it to teach and do it justice. It's it's a lot. It's really a lot. But I thank God for for learning, and I thank God for you all. Um. This is only a few, only a select few of people are going to be able to get this. And I believe with everything that's in me that there is a crown stored up in heaven for everybody who finishes this course. These, these, this book, you know, I believe because the Bible says at the end, you're blessed. At the end of this book, it says you are blessed. Just to sit and go through this book like this. I believe there's a crown. And that's why everybody can't sit under this teaching. It's too long. It's too complicated. They just can't get it. And maybe they'll come back through it another round, you know. But God promises us a blessing just for reading this book. And I can't wait to get mine. I can't wait to get mine, I tell you. <laughs>